Tonight is really a, a bittersweet night. It's bittersweet because we are very thrilled for Dr. Sugar that after decades of his practice and decades of living here up in the cold of Connecticut, he is going to be retiring and moving down to Florida and we are very, very happy for him. And as well, we are happy that he's leaving Connecticut in a time where he can really see that the efforts that he put in for many years with his work in the Federation and other organizations here in Connecticut have really borne fruit because, thank God, Judaism here in Connecticut is really, really thriving. But it's bittersweet because at the end of the day, as CTC is in its infancy and it's just getting started, we're really losing one of our very strong members and we are certainly going to miss him. At the same time, I want to acknowledge Rabbi Noy, who despite a very hectic work schedule, has been a dedicated member here at CTC and like Dr. Sugar one time described it as peeling an onion, just it's a sweet onion, but you keep on getting to another layer and another layer. And we appreciate Rabbi Noy for all of his contributions and I would like to ask Rabbi Noy to please share with us some words. Okay. Um, I wanted to share some words in this bittersweet moment about what I gained from uh, my partner, though he usually claims that he gained from me. It's certainly a two-sided relationship that happens to coincide very well with something that's written in the parsha. Of course, whenever we want to speak on a timely topic, we look to what we're going to be reading that week, which we see as some form of divine providence, some message for timely topics. We're beginning a new book this week, and with a new book, we present a new character in Jewish history. It's going to change Jewish history forever. We're introduced to Moshe Rabbeinu and Moses comes on the scene for the first time. We're introduced to him from his infancy, from his birth. And the scene that takes place immediately after he's born tells a lot about what he's going to accomplish in his life and, in fact, why he was able to accomplish what he accomplished in his life. And it will be a sign from heaven and to heaven that he is the person to be chosen. Um, after he's removed from the water from Pharaoh's daughter and his life saved, uh, it says that he started growing up. So it says that the Pasuk says, And it was in those days, that Moshe grew up, and Rashi says that it doesn't necessarily mean in, in size, but it means in maturity, in, in stature, in wisdom. And he grew up, and he had a curiosity about him. And he wanted to see, he, we're, we're told that he found out that he was of Jewish origin, and though he grew up in the, in the Egyptian palace, he had this curiosity about him. And he knew that these Jews had some special side to them that the, that the Egyptians were suppressing, and he wanted to find out what it was. So he went out to his brothers who were slaves in the field. So what he saw was their sevel, which means their uh, their yoke, the, the hardships that they were that they were underneath. And immediately, the first act he does as a knowing Jew shows how he reacts when he sees his brothers, who are his newfound brothers, in their troubles. Vayar Ish Mitzri, he saw an Egyptian fellow, <clears throat> Egyptian slave driver, Maka Ish Ivri, who was, who was hitting and whipping a, a Jewish slave, Me'echov, and immediately it says Me'echov, from his brothers. He just found out he's a Jew, he goes out, the Torah says that he's going out to see his brothers, and then all of a sudden, he sees that somebody's hitting his brother. All of a sudden, it's his brother, even though it's probably his distant cousin. But in terms of how close he feels now after seeing what they're going through, immediately, what does he do? So the Torah describes how he made sure that nobody was looking and whatever that means in its distant form, nobody would come of this person, and he kills the Egyptian, and he buries him in the sand. And that's his first introduction to his brothers. He sees what they're going through, and his conscience can't let him witness this act without getting up and doing something about it. So conscience is something that myself and Dr. Sugar have been discussing for a few weeks now. We've been discussing life or death issues, medical issues, and of course, Dr. Sugar is a very accomplished doctor. Um, 
But what one might not know is that uh, what we've discovered, what I've discovered in talking to him when we have brief moments to chat around our learning, is that uh, once upon a time, as, as uh, Rabbi Levine mentioned, that Dr. Sugar has been involved communally on a local, state, and national scale, international scale as well, that when Jews in Russia were suffering, for example, Dr. Sugar was there on the scene in the Soviet Union trying to figure out going out, going out to see his brothers, they're in their, you know, the modern equivalent of Jews suffering, being suppressed, their, their amazingness being covered. What can I do for them? And not standing from across the world and looking out and seeing from a peak, what can I do? Oh, there's nothing to do. As if a rhetorical question, what can I do? Moshe Rabbeinu showed us that when a Jew asks, what can I do? It means, what can I do? And do something about it. And uh, I definitely learned that from Dr. Sugar. Uh, when it comes to Russian Jewry or any other way of helping communally. And not only that, but as a career choice. We have a person who made a career choice to follow their conscience. And as uh, Dr. Sugar has fed me in my punchline tonight, he said that his uh, most proudest moment was recently when uh, another doctor on the executive medical committee in the, in the hospital told him that the, mo the reason he's most sad that Dr. Sugar is leaving is because he was the conscience of the executive medical committee. You can't get a better punchline than that. Learning the, the value of the conscience, a doctor can easily, as we've spoken about, a doctor can easily think that they are controlling and not controlling for another power. But as we've discovered, there's a, there's a higher power we're trying to learn through the Talmud. And uh, Dr. Sugar's curiosity on one hand, like Moshe Rabbeinu's curiosity, what is this all about? I know that these Jews are, have some secrets about them, have this deep wisdom about them. What is it about? But then when that curiosity uncovers something, and it might be that they have, they're going through troubles, troubles <clears throat> and tribulations, then the question is, what can I do about it? Not just staying curiously, curious, curiously aside and saying, maybe there's something I can do about it, I'm not sure what I can do about it, um, but I'm going to do something about it, the question is what it is. So I definitely see that parallel here. Um, I have definitely learned from, from my partner in Torah um, what it means to act upon one's conscience, to be seriously curious about what Judaism means to us and how it's going to provoke us and promote us to deeply, continually uncover what it means to be a Jew and how that's going to play out in a practical level, how it feeds my, how it feeds my, uh, my job how it feeds my family life, how it feeds my communal life, and all of these things are obviously intertwined because at the end of the day, I'm servicing one higher power, and I am lucky to be a tool for that power. My job is to curiously and conscientiously discover what that is going to force me to do. Shkoyach. Shkoyach. Thank you so much.